Hello and uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our 15th Blue Health Virtual Seminar. Blue Health Virtual Seminar is a platform that allows health professionals to discuss current management habits of different health-related topics for better patient care. And uh, this platform is brought to you by Blue Health Ethiopia, a medical consultancy company founded by medical doctors and a computer engineer. And we aim to be an influential healthcare leader in, cre in creating a skilled community through easily accessible knowledge in preventive medicine. Uh, I am going to be your host, Adam Gitacho. I'm the CTO and co-founder at Blue Edutopia. And it's a pleasure to have uh, Dr. Thomas Kent-Bayena here with us. Dr. Thomas Kent-Bayena is an assistant professor in emergency medicine and critical care. He is also the head of Department of Emergency Medicine at the College of uh, Health Science at Sawa University. Uh, he is also the current focus lead at his department and the recipient of uh, Developing Countries Focus Educator Scholar from uh, in Emergency Medicine Ultrasound with honors under the Ultrasound Leadership Academy. His work uh, focuses on cl clinical research on which he is professionally certified from Harvard Medical School. Academian, leader, and uh, clinical care emergency and critically ill patients at uh, Tukurambasa Specialized Hospital. And uh, he has also uh, has uh, an extensive experience in international conference presentation and peer reviewed uh, publication and so on. And uh, we are honored to have, and uh, we really appreciate uh, uh, for you to sacrifice your energy and time to present to us the ultrasound application for trauma, uh, FAST and EFAST. Uh, e uh, to give you a little background about the, the session, the session is going to last for 90 minutes and uh, Dr. Tamaskan will give his presentation first. After that, there will be a question, a short question and answer. So participants who want to ask their questions, you can use the question, the Q&A part of the Zoom. At the end of the session, participants who want to get the 1.5 CEU CPD certificate can take the quiz at the end of the session and get uh, uh, the 1.5 CEU CPD certificate for 100 bar. Anything related to the certificate and how you can get it will be uh, communicated through email after the session. Uh, since I've taken quite a few time for the introduction, Dr. Thomas Kambayana, uh, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you, Adam, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for the warm introduction, and it's a pleasure for me to have the audience and to talk on this timely and important uh, topic. So we will proceed with our discussion, as you have rightly introduced. It's ultrasound application in trauma, which is a vast area. Uh, as most of us know it, but we try to focus on the most important aspects. Otherwise, utilization of ultrasound in emergency rooms or emergency departments is quite vast, and that's why we are just focusing on the trauma uh, aspect. This will be the outline of uh, my talk. Uh, we will have the introduction, then we will proceed with the point of care ultrasound utilization in general in emergencies with a brief introduction. And then we we'll try to cover some of the pros and cons of, I mean, diagnostic modalities in trauma in general. We try to go with principles about the focused assessment with sonography in trauma uh, utilization, as well as some scanning tips and the common sites. And finally, we concluded with ocular uh, ultrasound in trauma with uh, summary. These are the objectives. Uh, as far as the presentation is concerned, we try to touch on the introduction aspect about the ultrasound utilization. Uh, subsequently, we'll go with three diagnostic aids in trauma. Uh, as we know, the diagnostic peritoneal lavage is there, CT scan of the abdomen is there, and then we do have the emergency ultrasound. Subsequently, we try to have some overview about uh, some of the mistakes we may tend to do during our scanning sessions and some troubleshooting tips for that 
uh, purpose. To start with the introduction, I try to repeat the word focus so many times because uh, it is the uh, standard or the international term for utilization of ultrasound and emergencies on real time basis. So it's defined as point of care and ultrasound, which is a quick and rapid utilization of focused ultrasound uh, scanning uh, for those patients who present with emergency with critical illnesses for different purposes. So the point of care ultrasound definition as it focuses quite on the emergency and critical patient presentations. And its utilization is on real-time basis quite actively. And that's why the term, the point of care component is coined by Matter and uh, others on 1994 publication, as well as the curriculum for emergency ultrasound utilization. So it works hand in hand with our phys I mean, physical examination, as well as our uh, history uh, taking. So it's one of the tools which we use it quite a lot. Nowadays, for an emergency physician, it's quite a lot used when it's compared with our stethoscope and so on. So it evaluates the change in patient's condition on dynamic basis, and it helps us in guiding treatment as well as procedures, and also to help us in patient uh, response monitoring and so on. So its utilization in trauma is one of the most commonest uh, aspects from point of care ultrasound. Otherwise, we can use it in first trimester pregnancy scan, in those presentations with uh, fracture, let us say, on those pediatrics cases, on ocular trauma, and so on, and to identify undifferentiated types of shock presentations to emergency department, as well as even to the ICUs and in the uh, wards. So the common areas are divided into almost more than 13 core areas, but for the sake of our talk, we try to focus on the American College of Emergency Physicians classification as far as emergency point of care ultrasound use is concerned. So its use is resuscitative, as I have said. If we are doing trauma resuscitation, we can use our ultrasound as an adjunct for diagnostic purposes. If we are focusing on picking pneumothorax for someone who presents with trauma, we can use it as a diagnostic tool on top of our history and physical examination. It can help us in those scenarios with symptom or sign-based presentations. It has its own procedural guidance for those patients presenting with trauma. And let us say, if you are in difficulty to secure peripheral IV line, even the central IV line, we can use our ultrasound. It, it can guide us for a procedural aspect. It's therapeutic as well as monitoring because of its utilization. For example, if we are giving flow resuscitation for a trauma patient or even blood product, and if we want to check the volume status, subsequently we can use uh, emergency ultrasound. Let me take you to this uh, real-time case. 50-year-old male who hit his right torso with a fast-moving car. It's a car crash, denies any head trauma, and the patient can walk without any limb. Within two hours, the pain on his lower chest increased and the patient came to emergency room or emergency department based on, based on wherever you work. So what do you think are the priorities for this case? And can we safely send this patient to imaging, uh, let us say, radiology room? I can ask, accept answers on the chat box and maybe Adam will help me with this. What uh, are the priorities for this case? So I'm just bringing this question because this can be a blunt uh, trauma, which involves chest or abdomen. And as we know, chest and abdominal trauma, especially when they are blunt injuries, they do have this challenge for emergency physicians or whoever is working in the emergency setup. Particularly, Bleeding may not be externally visible in some of the scenarios, but despite that, patients can be critical and they may even deteriorate in terms of their hemodynamics and vital sign. Okay, to use our time, let us proceed with the case. These are the vital signs for this case. Blood pressure fairly within range, 
slightly tachycardic with birth rate of 110, slightly tachypenic as well with respiratory rate of 24. There is a minor aberration to the right lateral chest with uh, tenderness to palpation, and there is a diffuse type of mild abdominal tenderness. To give you a clue, this patient uh, was on warfarin for an unknown, uh, I mean, for a known uh, valvular atrial fibrillation. So having this clue, we may rapidly start to go with bilateral large bore IV resuscitation with fluid. By the time we get filler products, we can proceed with that. And on the meantime, bedside ultrasound perform. And bedside ultrasound, as you see from the picture, we will go for the details later on, uh, reveal the finding. A chest X-ray was done at the same time. It revealed lower uh, reef fractures. But otherwise, there is no pneumothorax or hemothorax. So with this, the team started the patient with fresh frozen plasma resuscitation, or our team notified. And finally, the patient was found to have a liver laceration with around one liter of fillet uh, in the peritoneal cavity, mainly on the uh, right upper part. So having this case, I will take you to the uh, different diagnostic modalities in uh, blunt uh, abdominal trauma in general. As we all know, the blunt abdominal trauma or blunt chest trauma can be quite challenging uh, presentation, as I have mentioned earlier. We do have these three tools, diagnostic peritoneal lavage, which was more or less on, the, on use for long uh, times, for years and years, and the city of the abdomen, which is almost the gold standard nowadays, especially when we focus for the solid organ injuries and so on, and then a rapidly evolving tool, ultrasound, in the format of the point of care uh, aspect. So they do have their own benefits as well as uh, their own, uh, I mean, gaps in terms of reaching into diagnosis or helping for our resuscitation of the patient. But quite interestingly, if we take ultrasound from these three, there was a study which was done in uh, 2006 by uh, Melinka Rital and others. They came up with a plus uh, randomized control trial on which they compared Patients for whom ultrasound on the bedside was done, and for those uh, controls with no ultrasound. Quite interestingly, they came up with a 64% less time for uh, operative care for those patients for whom point of care ultrasound was done. So there was this significant reduction in terms of uh, duration which it takes to, to decide for such uh, critical patients. So this was the base for uh, rapid uh, involvement of ultrasound utilization in trauma. To say a few words about uh, DPL, CT abdomen, and ultrasound, as far as their advantages and disadvantages are uh, concerned, if you take DPL, it's quite an invasive procedure where we are trying to aspirate fluid in the abdomen to confirm for possible hemoperitoneum. And it may even be done with infusion of saline into the peritoneum and subsequently analyzing sample for possibility of filling in the uh, peritoneum or not. It can be done at the bedside. It can be done within some 10 to 15 minutes. But the issue is it's a bit overly sensitive. I mean, uh, with this point, if we end up uh, inadvertently puncturing a certain vessel and if we aspirate blood on our syringe, we may falsely say that this patient is having hemoperitone. So that aspect of it makes it a bit overly uh, sensitive. But with, because of that issue, it may lead us to too much laparotomy cases. So that is something which uh, we don't want to proceed as far as there is no any right indication. It's invasive, as I said. It's obviously difficult to do, especially on term pregnancies and for those patients with uh, previous uh, surgeries and so on. So its repeatability is uh, uh, questionable because of its invasive uh, nature. Again, CT abdomen has its own advantages and disadvantages. 
as I say, the baseline for CT abdomen, it's a gold standard for uh, most of blunt abdominal injuries because it picks quite a specific type of solid organ injuries and so on. But it has disadvantages. As a tool, as an equipment, it's quite expensive. It takes almost half an hour to one hour to complete the study. And quite interestingly, those patients who are unstable in terms of their vital signs, we may not transport them safely without uh, resuscitating them adequately and so on. So from that point of view, as well as its radiation nature, puts into the uh, disadvantage category. Uh, as far as the advantages are concerned, it's highly sensitive and specific, and it helps uh, it help us to reach into the right diagnosis as far as all of viscous injuries uh, are concerned. Quite similarly, when we go for ultrasound, it has its own benefits and uh, its own disadvantages. So the focus assessment with sonography and trauma concept came initially just to assess four specific sites and to pick for collection of fluid in the abdomen. That fluid may not be blood, which we will come later for uh, further discussion. And the other site is in the pericardium. So those were the main focus areas from the earlier days of focus assessment with sonography and trauma. But nowadays, it has additional component with extended fast with which we can go beyond collection of blood in the abdomen or pericardium. Rather, we look into the uh, hemothorax for peroral effusion. We will go for assessment of the ocular trauma, any raise in intracranial pressure and so on. And we can do further scans in terms of uh, fracture uh, confirmation and to look also for fracture stabilization and so on. So there is this overview of transitions. The original papers from the literatures focused on those free uh, intraperitoneal fluid collection or pericardial fluid collection. But subsequently, the involvement goes beyond that, which uh, I have already uh, mentioned on the previous slide. Let me share you this uh, case experience that was uh, during my residency training, during third year training that was in 2017. A man on his 30s presented after having a significant mechanism car crash and the patient was not communicating and there were bruises all over the chest with seat belt sign. And this patient deteriorated while upon stabilization of the primary survey. When I say the primary survey, we were focusing on the airway, breathing circulation, assessing the disability with uh, GCS and also exposure status of the patient. So the patient was having respiratory failure, and our earlier fast EFAST scan was indeterminate. We were not having enough evidences to tell that this patient is having pneumothorax or hemothorax in the chest. Right upon our rapid sequence intubation, that's emergency airway protection, uh, sudden bilateral chest uh, subcutaneous emphysema developed, and neck vein distension came into, uh, I mean, uh, it worsened. We, with the uh, time it was, unrecordable blood pressure subsequently. So our emergency point of uh, care ultrasound, uh, EFAST, re-scan, revealed absent right side and lung slide. So later for this patient, bilateral chest tube insertion, and then patient salvaged with uh, no cardiac arrest. And this was how the uh, case evolved. So from this, what do you think was going on for this case? maybe within a minute or so, uh, let's have some answers on the chat box. Okay, excellent. I can see tension pneumothorax after intubation. So the issue is, why do you think the tension pneumothorax developed with intubation for this patient? The other answer, although there is hemothorax there. Okay, thank you for the answers. Uh, interestingly, this was tension pneumothorax. Subsequent scans didn't show any peroral effusion or hemothorax features. So the issue was, at times in trauma presentations, especially during earlier scan, there may be what we call occult pneumothorax. That may not be 
detected on the uh, ultrasound scan earlier, considering the critical state of this patient and so on. The team was rushing for immediate uh, life-threatening injury. That In that case, re respiratory failure was there, so intubation was planned, and that was the issue. And similarly, the patient's airway needs uh, protection. So the occult pneumothoraxes can be converted to tension pneumothorax when we start to ventilate the patient with bugging right after our rapid sequence intubation. So that's why if we detect any possibility of pneumothorax prior to our intubation attempts, it's advised to uh, insert chest tube. So when we come to the focused assessment with sonography in trauma advantage versus disadvantage, I will try to link this with the uh, case which I uh, presented earlier. So advantage, it's quite portable and a scan can be completed within three to five minutes. Even nowadays, literature suggests two to three minutes uh, completion of the four major sites. It's a non-invasive tool, which we can repeat many times. And it's equally or, I mean, uh, somehow acceptably sensitive and specific when it's compared even with uh, CT. It has its own disadvantage. So the main issue, as far as the discussion of emergency ultrasound and scanning and predicting findings is concerned, it's obvious that it's an operator-dependent tool. Someone who did 10 scans, or let's say 25 scans, to detect a finding of hemoperitoneum may not detect as equally to someone who is more experienced enough in terms of uh, doing scans hundreds and hundreds of times. So it may not pick specific types of injury, which is one of its drawbacks when it's compared with the city, and it's poor for hollow viscous injuries and retroperitoneal uh, bleeds and trauma, and body habitus of the patient can also affect fast scan, like obesity or even subcutaneous air collections, let us say in the chest, which may interfere with the findings and so on. For the earlier case which I mentioned, uh, which developed the tension pneumothorax, the issue was the timing as well as the amount of the uh, pneumothorax itself. So had it been the scan uh, possible with, uh, let us say, hours and hours, even though that's very difficult with the uh, obvious nature of the respiratory failure, our detection for the pneumothorax may be quite easy. So it takes time for both blood and air to collect. So because of that, repeatability is one of the important pillars in doing focused assessment with sonography trauma. So when we go for the principles of focused assessment with uh, sonography uh, in trauma, it detects pre intraperitoneal fluid. This is an important point to consider because every fluid which is detected on ultrasound scan may not be blood. It can be pre-existing ascites. It can be a rupture of bladder during the trauma incident. And it can be any content for that month. So there are other issues like blood and fluid takes time to pull on the dependent areas in our abdomen. As we all remember from our anatomy, there are communications in our abdomen. The intraperitoneal spaces are there. We all know the uh, Morrison's porch is a dependent area on the right upper quadrant. And there are intersections and spaces on the left upper quadrant as well as on the uh, pelvis. The other is the other important component here, apart from the three abdominal sites, is abdominal pelvic sites is also the cardio, I mean the cardiac uh, site where we can detect for possible pericardial field. So all in all, this depends on the dependent sites where blood or any fluid can accumulate. At times, we can extend our scan to the uh, lateral aspects, to the uh, right as well as left paracolic gutters so that if there are any uh, expanding collections they are swayed. So pelvis and supra mesocolic areas can communicate from the anatomy and the ligaments are there and in blunt abdominal trauma as we all know liver and the spleen they are commonly injured uh, organs. Liver represents largest organ there and its size is quite an important tool for our ultrasound scanning. Uh, we will see the technical details uh, later on as well. 
So the first principle, this is what I've already mentioned. Whatever is the collection in the abdomen can be anything. It's not only blood in that sense. For example, the case which I presented earlier, which was taking warfarin for a non-valvular AFE and came with that trauma with a collection in the uh, abdomen, obviously the history and the clue may lead us to uh, the collection being blood in the abdomen. But similarly, if this patient was having, let us say, heart failure, it can be a pre-existing ascites unless the vital sign arrangement goes hand in hand with our ultrasound find. So focused assessment with sonography in trauma has its limitations because of its insensitivity in detecting specific types of uh, organ injuries as well as the retroperitoneal collections. And the amount of the fluid also matters. If we are scanning, let us say, within two minutes of uh, crash accident and so on, we may not get positive find. But if we do that same scan, hours after, we can get a positive uh, find. So this is one of the important aspects to consider in doing the ultrasound. So it's an operator-dependent tool, unless there are lots of trainings in such continuous uh, professional development uh, formats, it may be a bit difficult for a beginner to do the scan and to pick the findings. So what are the evidences supporting trauma utilization ultrasound from the extent of FAST to its more recent uh, utilization to the extent as eFAST? So there are multiple uh, studies which were done internationally, both in USA, mainly by American College of Emergency Physicians, from that very first curriculum, which was developed in 1994, till now, and the uh, ATLS protocol uh, on its every edition nowadays, utilizing, utilization, I mean, using ultrasound on trauma management all the time. So there are also similar supporting studies from Europe, Japan, as well as policy statements from leading emergency societies in the form of American College of Emergency Physicians, International Federation of Emergency Physicians, and surgical societies as well. If you come to our country, nowadays at least Ethiopian Society of Emergency Professionals is quite advocating its utilization in emergency settings, in the ICUs, and in pre-hospital uh, settings as well, as far as trained uh, human power is uh, there. So utilization of uh, ultrasound in trauma has these important uh, time points. It can be during the very first resuscitation in primary survey. It can be used during our physical exam in picking the findings for, let us say, pneumothorax, which is not tension uh, enough to cause uh, rapid deterioration for stabilization of fracture site or dislocation and so on, monitoring response when we resuscitate uh, patients with uh, fluid as well as blood products. And to make things more interesting, it's becoming more and more portable nowadays. We were using ultrasounds which are big enough to move from place to place rather than moving critical patients. But nowadays, that became quite easier because what we move is only the uh, portable ultrasound or the probe of the ultrasound to do the scan wherever is uh, the patient. That can be in a triage setting, pre-hospital setting, in the ICU, so even the uh, wards and uh, so on. As far as the equipments are considered, in the emergency setup, at least, we focus on two ultrasound probes, which are almost uh, the bread and butter of the ultrasound equipment. So there is a curvedary, or what you call a curvilinear probe, which we see from this picture, the first and the second. The differences are on their footprints, so that we can accommodate sites which are not crowded with ribs. Like in the abdomen, we can use the bigger footprint curvilinear probe, whereas in those areas, like in chest, to look for every chamber of the heart, we can go with smaller footprints, but still curved probes. So this is with a reason we will see some of the physics aspects on subsequent slides. So when we say the curved array or curvilinear probes, they are by default low frequency probes. So when the frequency is quite low enough, there is this possibility of more depths. 
And when the uh, probes are more linear enough, and when the frequency is quite uh, high, there is this less pairs. So that is the issue with the uh, two types of the equipment's uh, variabilities. Otherwise, ultrasound equipment picks sound waves which are beyond the hearing capacity of human beings. That means we can detect the sounds with frequencies ranging from 2 megahertz to 18 for ultrasound, whereas for human being, it's just like 20 kilohertz or so, which is the maximum as our hearing capacity. But most of our ultrasounds, their frequency range in uh, 2 to 4, let us say. So the low frequency probes can go and we can look more deeper structures like in the abdomen and the heart, whereas with the high frequency or the linear probes, which is on my next uh, slide, we see it here, we can only detect superficial structures with the cost of the uh, depths. So the depths and the frequency are inversely proportional from this uh, discussion. To make things easier, there are probes in between, like a phased array probe, which can help us in looking all the structures, be it the superficial or a deeper one, just by adjusting the depth of the uh, ultrasound. So in that case, there is what we call a phased array probe. And even now these days, because the ultrasounds are more portable, what we can do is only connecting a single probe with our tablet or with our phone, so that we can change from one preset like abdomen to another preset to look for superficial structures and so on. So there is no need of changing one probe to the other on a bigger machine nowadays because it becomes quite easy to change the preset uh, on our computers and on our uh, phones as well. So what is the time to complete a scan? A typical or a traditional fast scan, which I mentioned for the four sites, the right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, pelvic scan, and subxiphoid view to look for pericardial effusion takes an average three to five minutes. So this came from studies because each view lasts from uh, half minute to one minute. And there was this interesting finding from an earthquake in Armenia in 1988. By then, almost 400 trauma ultrasound scans were performed in 72 hours. So this average maximum of 10 minutes to complete a scan. Consider maybe moving the patient, trying to adjust the flexibility with the probes and the patient positioning and so on. Those things may take time to prolong it up to 10 minutes, but usual typical fast scan by experienced personnel nowadays is less than five minutes. So when we come to the important sites of the scan, at least our uh, typical fast constitutes these four sites. The sub view on which we can look the pericardium for pericardial effusion, which can cause possible cardiac tamponade. And we look for right upper quadrant, where we try to look the space in between liver and kidney, which is one of the common and easiest sites to do the fast scan. And the third one is the left upper quadrant, Quite opposite to the right upper quadrant, this is a bit difficult site, which can, uh, which requires a bit of technical uh, movements with our props and so on. And the fourth one, to look for pelvis, we do uh, supra pubic uh, area, just by going some two centimeters above the pubic uh, symphysis. So to do each scan requires its own technique, but when we go with sensitivity of fast scan, it increases with increased number of views. And finally, not only the right upper quadrant or left upper quadrant scan, we may even extend that scan from the junction between the chest and abdomen to the uh, whole chest so that we can look for any peroral effusion uh, and pneumothorax. There. When we compare the sensitivity and the specificity of ultrasound in trauma, nowadays, it's near equivalent to our CT scan. So it's 99, 99 as far as sensitivity and specificity is concerned. If we go years back during the start of the uh, ultrasound utilization in trauma, these numbers were quite in a low range, quite for an obvious reason, because the expertise, the training, 
and the advocacy and everything was lacking by then. But nowadays, the training is there, the updates and so on with more curriculums to the extent of doing emergency ultrasound on its uh, fellowship and subspecialty formats. People are more experienced and can uh, make the sensitivity and specificity in range like 99. So the arrows on the picture uh, states that how to move our proposition. We can start at the junction, thoracoabdominal junction, and based on our site, we can move it either counterclockwise or clockwise direction until we can get the right anatomical site to detect for possible fluid collection or not. So the clinical experience with uh, FAST increased through time. As far as sensitivity and specificity are concerned, they increase through time with more training. And if we take, let us say, the right upper part and the Morrison's porch, the sensitivity years back was in the range, like 30% to 80%. So this is a quite a wide range. But if we take this same number nowadays, it goes up to 95 to 99%. So all this increased because of the trainings, as I said, just by making our techniques more and more comfortable to pick the findings and trying to make patients on a comfortable position and also making our exams more serious. So the saying is, uh, as little as a quarter of uh, cc of fluid in the abdomen can be picked by a novice uh, uh, personnel with little training, someone can pick fluid collection as low as 200 to 250 cc, which can go a bit smaller, like 50 to 100 cc of fluid detection in experienced hands. So here are the pic uh, picture-based uh, formats to show the techniques and the basic principles as far as the scans are uh, concerned. Let me start with the right upper quadrant view, which is a quite easier view. Uh, and it has its own reasons because of its easy nature, nature to pick the uh, findings uh, there. What do you think is uh, what do you think makes the right upper quadrant scan easier sight? You can leave the brief answers on the chat box. Okay, thank you. Uh, liver. As it's rightly said on the uh, chat box uh, answers uh, part, liver, because of its larger size, it's an important landmark, which helps us being an acoustic window to look for different structures, be the collection of a fluid or the other structures like uh, kidney and so on. So for this technique, we have to make sure as far as ultrasound scanning in emergency is concerned, except for some of the cardiac views, always, our pro positioning should be with a pro pointer marked to the right side of the patient and to the safe alert position vertically during our vertical scannings. For example, if we look the the picture here for the right upper quadrant scan, the pro pointer is on the safe alert aspect towards the head of the patient. And if we are doing this same scan on transverse format, we will change the pro pointer towards the right side of the patient. And we try to remove the rib interface because ribs can create a shadow to look into the findings there. So we have to avoid that shadow and the movement should be some 30 degree counterclockwise movement. This picture clearly states the uh, findings I say. If we start from the anterior aspect, what we catch from the ultrasound probe is quite the larger aspect of the liver and then part of the kidney. If we go in between the posterior and anterior aspect, obviously we can get a part of the liver, which is smaller from the anterior view, and then part of the inferior pole of the kidney, and then the beam goes towards the uh, spine. And if you go more posteriorly, what we get is a smaller portion of the liver with, let us say, the largest aspect of the kidney, and then towards the spine. So each view has its own pros and cons. If you go with the first one, with the anterior view, we may be able to get possible fluid collection in between liver and kidney. And at the same time, there may be a gallbladder there which can interfere with our finding. So with dynamic scan, with a flexible movement of our probe, 
vertical as well as uh, inferior aspect to the right to the left with all those uh, techniques we can try to get as many findings as possible so with that uh, this is the normal picture which we can get from our uh, very uh, first scanning on a normal uh, patient with no any uh, collection as we see here liver is positioned safe a lot from the superior aspect we see a structure which is quite hyperechoic here diaphragm in ultrasound as we all know the hyperechoic is a term which we use to, to tell the fact that the ultrasound beam is reflected back from the structure there and we say anechoic when the entire beam of the ultrasound passes so fluid and air they are quite obviously anechoic whereas bone is quite common hyperechoic structure. So in between that, the body tissues can be either hypoechoic or isoechoic in relative terms by comparing with other structures. So we see kidney on the inferior aspect with its pose poles, and you can see the uh, asterisk sign here, which states the space in between liver and kidney. So this is actually a place which we try to look for any fluid accumulation when someone comes with blunt abdominal uh, trauma. Here we can see again another normal uh, right upper quadrant scan where we can see the image on a longitudinal format. We see the larger aspect of the liver as we say it, as a landmark or as an accusative window, we see the entire uh, size of the kidney with its superior as well as inferior pole. Here is the superior pole towards the, the diaphragm, and here is the inferior pole, an important site where we try to look for uh, fluid accumulation. So we can clearly see the different aspects of the cortex as well as the middle of the kidney and the renal sinuses uh, with its uh, isoequic to anechoic nature. Where there is a blood vessel with fluid, we can see sites with uh, anechoic nature. So here we see the finding, our very first finding from the fast scan, as far as right upper quadrant scanning is uh, concerned. As I said, everything which is fluid, be it blood or ascites or any uh, ruptured bladder with the peritoneal, intraperitoneal ruptures or so, we can get a stripe like this whenever there is a fruit collection between the liver and kidney. So what's the implication of this fluid accumulation? As our interest in emergency is not to detect the finding of the fluid here, it's not a diagnosis aspect. So what is the implication from this finding? Let us say this same patient is having a stable vital sign versus unstable vital sign. What are the implications? Any answers on the chat box? What's the implication of having this fluid collection in the peritoneal cavity on someone with uh, trauma? Let us say the vital signs are unstable first. Okay, maybe a conservative management. Okay, thank you. Uh, as you rightly answer, if a patient with blunt abdominal trauma comes to your emergency with an unstable vital sign, let us say unrecordable blood pressure or low uh, record of blood pressure, and we can detect this finding, we will start our aggressive resuscitation with initial bolus of fluid and blood products and so on. And at the same time, we will notify the OR team, surgical team. But if this same patient is with a stable vital sign, despite this finding, it gives us some time to work up further so that we can detect the exact nature of the injury, be it a liver laceration or be it renal injury. So that is the implication. Blunt abdominal trauma patient with an unstable vital sign requires laparotomy. That is one of the algorithmic approaches. And blunt abdominal trauma patient with a stable vital sign gives us time to do further uh, workups to reach into the right uh, diagnosis. So as far as the collection of blood is concerned, on earlier accumulations, blood can be purely unequal. But later, when it starts to coagulate, when clothes form, it starts to become hypoechoic. And even 
it ends up being hyperbole. So we have to be very careful with these uh, terms. And we have to correlate all these findings with the uh, vital sign of the tissue. So on the first picture, you can see a normal Morrison's porch. As we see rightly, the larger size of the liver and the kidney is there, even though it's inferior pole is not as such quite visible. We do have the diaphragm here and beyond the diaphragm is the chest. And on the picture uh, lower down, we see a free fluid, which is forming almost two or three out poachings there with kidney inferiorly, liver superior. So each out poaching, a rough estimate is half a liter of fluid. So if it's blood, imagine how this can uh, affect the vital sign of the patient in acute trauma scenarios. This is another picture with entire size of kidney visible, both superior and inferior pole. So there is this stripe, black stripe in between, which dictates the finding with uh, fluid collection in the upper. This is more or less similar, but the collection is not only on the right side of the liver, rather on the left side as well. So at times we end up getting even the fluid collection superior to the liver. So as far as it's inferior to the diaphragm, so that is uh, still intra-abdominal uh, collection. This is more or less uh, similar. So detection of fluid by ultrasound is affected by different uh, parameters, as I have said. As simple as the positioning of the patient or just trying to talk with the patient as far as the patient is cooperative enough with the uh, pattern of the injury and so on, we can communicate with the patient and we try to take whatever is the comfortable position for the patient. We try to look for the location of the bleed as well as the rate of bleeding and we try to look our experience in terms of doing such studies. So this, the value of sensitivity of ultrasound depends on all those uh, parameters. So if we are not able to detect fluid in the abdomen with ultrasound in acute uh, trauma, with blunt uh, abdominal trauma, it doesn't mean that there is no bleeding. It can be a self-limiting bleeding with a small laceration or so. So in that case, we may not get a positive find. So such kinds of patients, as far as the suspicion is there for possibility of solid organ injuries in the abdomen, we may proceed with uh, further imaging modalities. So this is uh, what I have mentioned already. All blood in the abdomen is not, uh, I mean, all fluid in the abdomen is not blood because everything which is listed here can be unequal on our uh, ultrasound uh, detection. So there are these mimics of fluid in right upper quadrant scan. It can be obese patient with perinephric fat or so. In that sense, we may still take it as a, a mimicker for uh, fluid collection in the abdomen. So the simple trick to differentiate this is to do the scan on the other side. If there are bilateral perinephric fat, that is uh, another thing which may interfere with our finding. In that case, we can relate the findings with the clinical nature of the patient. So we try to look for possible abdominal inflammations as well. As far as the muscles are contracted, it can clearly affect the impedance of the ultrasound. And in that case, our beam of the ultrasound may not reach to the entire structures where we are interested to look for the findings. So we have to come up with techniques to try to minimize these interruptions. So common pitfalls or common wrongdoings which we may do in right upper quadrant scan are not attempting enough sites, doing the scan quite early, and then not repeating as many scans as possible, and also uh, not repeating the scans. These are some of the wrong things which we can uh, do most of the time. So the next important site of uh, ultrasound scanning trauma in the abdomen is the left upper quadrant. It's a bit difficult technically uh, to do this scan. Uh, and let me ask you the reasons for its difficulty. Why do you think it is technically difficult to do a scan on the uh, left upper quadrant when it's compared with the left upper quadrant? Maybe answers on the chat box. Okay. Uh, okay, there was uh, there is an answer which says no landmark. 
rather than that, there is a landmark, but the issue is the size of that landmark on the left upper quadrant is not equal to the landmark on the right upper quadrant. Obviously speaking, it's the liver, which is bigger size on the uh, right upper quadrant when it's compared with the spleen on the left upper quadrant. And also this site needs more of a posterior technique to angle our probe and to make it more oblique so that we can take the uh, finding with uh, avoiding of the rib shadow so on. So those were the reasons. And the difficulties are something which we try to overcome with the repeated scans. So there is uh, no as big structure as liver on the left upper quadrant, uh, which is one of the interesting uh, reasons. And this is a normal uh, finding when we do the left upper quadrant scan. You see the uh, arrow marks. There is no any stripe in between the spleen and kidney. So there is no collection in between and as well as surrounding the spleen, as well as surrounding the kidney. Quite interestingly on this side, it's more important to look for the spaces in between, spaces surrounding spleen, as well as spaces surrounding the uh, kidney. So fluid accumulation can be on any of those uh, three sites. So the picture on the uh, upper part is normal spleen or renal view. You see a rib shadow here, which is affecting passage of the ultrasound beam. As far as the rib is there, it reflects the ultrasound beam, and there is no passage of that beam towards the uh, spleen and kidney. That's why we are getting this black thing. So that's what we call the rib shadow. But on the picture lower down, you see findings of the spleen with its uh, isoechoic to hypoechoic uh, nature and surrounding. And also on this side, you can get the black thing, uh, which is fluid. Maybe this is a larger picture where we can get a large collection surrounding the entire uh, spleen and also from this aspect. Quite interestingly on this picture, unless we do a dynamic or video view, we may not uh, say that this spleen is uh, not crashing with a linear uh, fracture line in between. If we do a dynamic view with video, it may be also uh, a crash or splenic fracture pattern in between. Otherwise, the fluid collection surrounding the spleen is uh, quite clear. Here again, this is a large collection entirely uh, encircling the spleen and also in between the kidney and the spleen. So this unequal thing is entirely fluid. So the point is, it's not about estimating the fluid uh, amount in the abdomen. In emergency setting, it's more of the vital sign correlation with the ultrasound findings, which guides us for uh, resuscitation purpose. On this picture, we see a stripe which is entirely surrounding the uh, spleen. Otherwise, the space between the spleen and the kidney seems fine, so we can see it's a surprise splenic collection. This is a larger view of uh, that same time. Okay. Uh, let me take you to the eFAST component. So far, we were trying to discuss on the FAST aspect, focused assessment with sonography and trauma, focusing on the abdominal right upper quadrant and the left upper quadrant aspect. But is it even possible to extend beyond those junctions, the thoracoabdominal junctions, in both the right and left upper quadrant so that we can look even further? The answer is uh, yes. Because we can extend from our right upper quadrant more toward the chest, as well as on the left upper quadrant more toward the chest to look for any peripheral effusion. In trauma, that peripheral effusion can be mostly blood or even to look for pneumothorax just by going more anterior aspect of the chest. So that is what we call the uh, extended focused assessment with sonography in trauma. So the trick is just to move our probe with a probe pointer still towards the cephalad aspect, towards the head of the patient, we move it more cephalad, more longitudinal, and subsequently the image we can get is superior to the liver. What we find is a diaphragm, and then above diaphragm is a space, that's the pleural space. So our main interest is to look for that pleural space if there is any fluid collection there. If it's acute trauma presentation, that fluid is mostly blood, as I say. You can see this uh, interesting picture where we can see the larger size of the liver here, then the kidney is there, and the space is okay, 
So we can say there is no floor in the Morrison's porch, at least from this view. Otherwise, the inferior pole of the kidney is missing because our attempt is to move our probe more safe alert so that we can look into the chest. What do you think is going on here? Any answer on the chat box? So this is a right upper quadrant scan on which we are trying to go beyond the abdomen. So fluid, excellent, yeah. Peroral fluid or hemothorax, both answers can go for this uh, finding. So as you see, the entire dome of diaphragm is almost pushed towards the liver. And here you can see an equate thing. And subsequently, what you are getting here is the hyperechoic thing because our ultrasound beam is passing the entire fluid and it's reflected back from the spine uh, bones from there. So as I said, bone reflects the entire abdomen, I mean the ultrasound beam, and that's why uh, we call this as an spine sign. Under normal circumstances, because there is no fluid here, there is no passage of ultrasound beam, and we will not get this reflection of the uh, spine. Spinal, I mean the vertebral body. So rather, because of the fluid, we are getting this finding. So that's what we call the uh, spine sign for this presentation. On subsequent slides, I will try to uh, demonstrate to you a video so that you can get the uh, findings. Okay, here you can see typical extended focused assessment with sonography in trauma aspect. So what aspect of kidney is missing from this uh, video? Once we pick that, we will go for the uh, fine. What aspect of the kidney is missing? Are we looking into the right upper quadrant view or more of the extended fast view to look for any peripheral flow? Okay, yes, the inferior pole of the kidney is missing. As I said, the inferior pole is to this side. I'm not sure if you are getting my the laser pointer, but that side is the inferior pole aspect of the kidney. As a way, the superior pole is here, and this is the larger size of the liver. But what is obscuring uh, our uh, visualization of the liver here? Is there any interruption to look into the liver from the discussion so far? Excellent. The rib shadow is exactly there which is affecting our view towards the liver, but otherwise the liver is moving and the rib shadow is moving. As far as it's moving, it's something which we can avoid to try to look into the more typical format. Do you think there is any fluid here? Is there any peripheral fluid or hemothorax from this video? Yes. Uh, okay, yes and no answers, but the no answers are the right ones because we don't get any fluid for this view because we actually see uh, when the video is played, you can see the tip of the lung moving as well as we are not able to see the uh, entire dome of the diaphragm and also the spine sign is not here. So from that uh, description, we try to look uh, to confirm for absence of fluid in the peripheral space just by trying to moving our, I mean, by moving our ultrasound probe uh, uh, more safe alert and also trying to make it posterior as well as oblique view. Uh, otherwise, the finding is, as far as the finding is concerned, the next video uh, may be helpful uh, for the description. So as you, as you, as you can get the video uh, from here, any finding, any striking uh, feature from this video, what do you see? What's missing? Okay, yes, yeah, it's hard to tell the rib shadow is obscuring. Uh, unless we go with further views, we may be in difficulty to say uh, for that, if that's true. What's missing from this view? What do you think is uh, missing from this view? So this is a view on which we have uh, tried to extend our ultrasound probe towards the more safe alert position. And by that, 
the entire dome of the diaphragm comes towards the liver and we are getting fluid collection here. And the reflection, which I said for the spine sign is here and the tip of the lung is moving uh, actually on uh, fluid. And here this picture uh, tells us more of the uh, interesting aspect of that finding because here you can see diaphragm, small collection of fluid on the pelora, but here this is a large pocket of the fluid with diaphragm pushed entirely lower down towards the liver and you can get the spine sign here because of the reflections of the ultrasound beam which is uh, passing without any resistance with the fluid accumulation. Okay, the other extension component, we have tried to look into the pleural fluid, which can be hemothorax in acute trauma uh, presentations. So the other important uh, aspect is looking for another life-threatening presentation in blunt chest trauma. Obviously, that's pneumothorax. Especially on its tension pneumothorax pattern, it will not give us any time. So lung ultrasound is uh, basically uh, used to detect uh, presence or absence of lung sliding. I will uh, try to demonstrate to you with the video and picture. So interpretation of the artifacts which are generated by the uh, ultrasound waves passing through the lung, through air and through fluid, can generate findings uh, later on. So this uh, slide tells us how to do uh, the, the technical aspects of trying to pick for uh, or scanning for pneumothorax. So we have to make sure that the patient is on the supine position and our scanning should be anteriorly and we place our uh, linear probe on mid-clavicular line vertically, making probe marker towards the cephalar or towards the head of the patient. Then we try to look the second intercostal space bilaterally and we move laterally around the uh, hertz for the left side because uh, the hertz chambers can interrupt the findings. So this is a typical picture we can get. As you see, this is straight, reflective line is what we call the pleural line. And below that, I mean, uh, you can get the lung tissue and the sideways, you can see two arrow heads. This is a rib and this is a rib. So in between the two ribs, we are trying to elicit the presence or absence of lung slide, meaning whether the lung is moving against the pleural under normal circumstances, with no air feeling there, that is the normal finding. But if that is affected and if there is absent lung sliding, that's what we are uh, saying that there is a uh, pneumothorax. So this is an easier three-way technique. First, identify a pleural line as a straight as uh, like this. And then we try to observe for lung sliding. Uh, I will show you the video format. And finally, try to elicit what we call the seashore or sky or ocean beach interface pattern, which is a normal finding when there is a lung tissue, minimal amount of pleural fluid and air interacting and forming that uh, seashore pattern. So lung sliding is an important uh, thing to pick from uh, this scan because the presence of lung sliding typically excludes pneumothorax with our linear uh, probe, but this can even require a very minimal training and uh, we can end up getting an interesting finding which can help us in guiding our uh, management. Its specificity may be into question, but its absence in the appropriate context can, uh, can be highly indicative of the presence of pneumothorax. So what do you see from this video? from the descriptions I have mentioned. Can we say the lung sliding is absent or not? Okay, this is normal because we can see the typical pattern of the lung sliding. As you see here, this is a pleural line. Let us look, this is a rib, this is a rib. So in between the two ribs, we can get the pleural line, which is actually moving against the lung tissue. And we are also getting the A lines a vibration patterns which projected downwards but not the entire uh, lanes. So that's what we call the A-lines and with this we can sense that we can say that uh, this is uh, there is no pneumothorax from this uh, line. What about this one? Can you sense any difference between the two? Can you sense any difference between the two? 
there is no lung sliding. Rather than saying no, uh, I mean lung point, we can say la- identifying lung point by itself is a bit intensive, and it is something which uh, we don't advocate as an emerge uh, team because picking lung point is more of a diagnostic interest and it takes time, uh, an important time to intervene for the uh, patient. So here you see a straight line. First, you can identify your ribs, uh, landmarks here as well, and then there is a straight pelural line where the lung is not moving. So this is absent lung sliding, which confirms the pneumothorax. Probably from this aspect, on the right side, there is this uh, stagnant finding, which can be a bit of a lung point, but it's more of a diagnostic interest uh, assignment. So there are other interesting signs which we try to elicit just by moving our uh, ultrasound dynamics into its M mode. Uh, what we can get is with the M mode, if it's there is a seashore and barcode uh, sign uh, pattern, when we press our ultrasound screen to view it in the motion mode, in the dynamic format, uh, M mode is formed when the ultrasound beam passes through the lung, of tissue and air. So in that case, even it is just the uh, passing through that minimal pleural flow. But when the barcode pattern occurs, or the, what we call the stratosphere sign, there is air which is tightening the entire space, the pleural space, so there is no access for the ultrasound beam to catch all those patterns. So because of the air nature, you can get the barcode uh, pattern. Okay, thank you. So our next and the third important uh, aspect of uh, focused assessment in sonography uh, with trauma is to look into the uh, pelvic uh, aspect. So our probe should be placed in the suprapubic position, both vertically or sagittally in transverse uh, formats. As I say, the principle works here. If we are placing the probe as transverse as like this, our probe pointer should be on the right side of the patient. And if we are placing it sagittally or vertically, the probe pointer should be on the cephalad or on towards the head of the patient. So the placement position is some two centimeters above the uh, symphysis uh, pubis, and it can be from both uh, views of the vertical and the, I mean, the transverse uh, formats. It helps us uh, to image, if possible, before the placement of catheter, the Foley catheter, so that bladder helps us being an important accusative uh, window. So this is a picture, anatomical picture, taken from the longitudinal or sagittal view. And what we see is the ultrasound probe with the probe pointer facing towards the head of the patient. And then right after that, we can get a full bladder, which can be an accusative window. And behind that is the uterus. And we can look for the cul-de-sac, the dependent area where fluid can accumulate. This is the ultrasound uh, cut from that sagittal view full bladder, we can see uterus behind that, and then the space with the uh, reflections and so on, with no flow. So we can also do this on the pelvic uh, transverse format. Again, in front of the uh, pro, we can get a bladder, subsequently uterus, bilaterally ovaries on the uh, female pelvis, and posteriorly, we will try to look for the uh, fluid in the pelvis. So this is a normal transverse picture where we can get bladder, as we can see it here, and subsequently the uterus structures uh, with minimal difficulty. Here we can get uh, the finding with the fluid accumulated, as you can uh, see it from both sides. Here is the bladder with its uh, linear and uh, I mean borders, and subsequently on bilateral aspect we can see black aneuric thing that is fluid. And on the right side, in addition to the black and equic thing, we can also see a small portion of hyperechoic thing which can be clothed uh, below at times, which can be more visible from this uh, sagittal uh, picture. So we see fluid in front of the uh, bladder, and at the same time, we can see a cloth of uh, blood, and just right next to the cloth of blood, uh, blood is this stripe, which is a uh, fluid accumulated on the sagittal Again, this is bladder with its borders kept intact. And then here is the uterus. Behind that, a large pocket of anechoic 
thing, which is fluid, and in addition to that, on this side as well. So this can be a liters and liters of fluid accumulation with unstable vital signs from pelvic trauma. Similarly, here we can see fluid. Here, it may mimic bladder, but it's different because its borders are not as such intact to that of the bladder pattern, and we can see bladder from this aspect. But if this same bladder is collapsed with no uh, urine uh, on it, we may be in difficulty to look uh, into the fluid accumulation. Okay, so the fourth aspect, important aspect in uh, fast exam is sub uh, view, or what we call a subcostal view, where we place our probe pointer. You can see a tiny dot type red mark, which is the probe pointer on the right side of the patient. And we are trying to place the probe parallel to the skin of the patient. And we are just looking towards the left shoulder so that we can elicit the chambers from our uh, hair. So this site is quite a uh, best site in trauma uh, management and in trauma ultrasound scan because it gives us enough space for any possible chest compression or even chest tube insertion for possible uh, hemothorax or even in patient pneumothorax or any cardiac arrest scenarios. By then we can do the chest compression without uh, interruption with our probe. If we can look on the other aspect, let us say on the, the apical aspect or on the parasternal views, it's not uh, feasible to do for a trauma patient on whom we are uh, doing the resuscitation aspect. So this is the pictorial representation which we can get from our ultrasound. As you can see the right side where liver is a good landmark to look for the right ventricle. And the left ventricle is obviously with its larger size and the muscle bulk, and we can get the, the atria like this. So this is the picture we can get from scanning. You can see the right ventricle adjacent to the uh, liver and left ventricle in the other structures. So the finding from this is here we can get a stripe which is surrounding the border of the right ventricle, just in between uh, the heart chamber and the liver. So this is a fluid accumulation in the pericardium. So if this is an acute scenario, there will be a pericardial uh, effusion causing cardiac uh, tamponade. So here is more uh, obvious uh, picture to look into the entire heart where the pericardial fluid is surrounding almost the entire chambers. In this scenario, if this is a dynamic or a video view, the heart may be entirely floating on this fluid. So this can be a chronic process on which patients can compensate. But if it's an acute presentation, obviously we can get such kinds of patients with obstructive shock state because of cardiac tamponade. And if this is a dynamic or a video view, we try to elicit the collapse of the right ventricle during the diastole, which can actually confirm the uh, echocardiographic, uh, echo, echocardiographic confirmation for possible cardiac number. So this is more or less a similar pattern. Again, here we see the right ventricle, left ventricle, entirely flu surrounding the right ventricle, just bordering the liver. Here again, a stripe of fluid surrounding pericardium. Again, if this is acute with any derangement in vital sign, what do you think is the implication? If someone with blunt trauma comes with unstable vital sign, and if we find such a scan on our bedside, so what's our next intervention? What's our intervention if we detect the tamponade physiology from acute trauma scenario. Excellent, yeah. Emergency pericardiosynthesis with ultrasound guidance, that's the most important uh, definitive management. And the issue of utilization of our ultrasound, not only for its uh, diagnostic purpose, rather for our resuscitative aspect, as well as for monitoring the response and also for therapeutic aspect, uh, I mean, which actually works here. So. I mean, doing pericardial synthesis in trauma presentations uh, defines the focus utilization in trauma on its base uh, representation because it's a diagnostic, therapeutic, as well as it guides us for monitoring the uh, response at the same time. 
So let us proceed uh, with this uh, some two minutes uh, or half video, uh, which is uh, published on Journal of uh, American Medical Association. It detects the importance of the focused assessment with uh, sonography in trauma on its uh, base format. It's a kind of summary for all those four standard views we try to cover, the right upper quadrant, the left upper quadrant, the supra cubic or the pelvic view, and the sub xiphoid or the subcostal uh, view. It's starting from the right upper quadrant. As I said, here is how to position the probe with the probe pointer towards the head or the cephalar side. And we try to look into the space in between. As you rightly see it, the size of the kidney is entirely visible. We can get the large size of the liver. And this is a dynamic view where we can even detect the smallest amount of fluid in between. And this is a large pocket of fluid in between the uh, liver and the kidney. So that is the easier view, which can be practiced with a minimum uh, scan. The left upper quadrant view, we try to look the scan in between the spleen and the kidney or surrounding the spleen. But interestingly, here we can see the finding in between the kidney and the spleen, the spleno, uh, renal uh, space. So at times, fluid can also be perisplenic, just surrounding the uh, uh, spleen. And in that scenario, there can be a liters and liters of fluid accumulation. The third, this is a vertical view, a sagittal view, and a transverse view for the pelvic scan. Just as I said, some two centimeters above the symphysis pubis. This is how to get fluid in the uh, dynamic uh, sagittal uh, view. You can see the size of bladder, which is full with urine, then fluid uh, behind the uh, bladder. And here you can see a large pocket of anechoic thing that is fluid accumulation. Just, uh, behind the blood. This is a transverse view. Side to side of the bladder, you can get this black and equate. So that is uh, fluid accumulation. So everything depends on the vital sign of the uh, patient. And our management is also detect, uh, I mean, dictated based on that. This is a sub xiphoid view. Pro pointer towards the right side. We position towards the left shoulder. And then we try to look the entire chambers. Here we do have the liver, right, ventricle and the fluid which is pushing the right ventricle as you see right like this okay uh, that's all about the focused assessment with sonography in trauma it's a fast and e-fast component to so say a few words in a few slides about ocular ultrasound because its utilization is equally important in trauma presentations uh, Patients can present with polytrauma or multi-system trauma in that while you are trying to look for any fluid collection in the abdomen or chest, and at the same time, patients can be comatose with severe traumatic brain injury, let us say. In those scenarios, picking for possibility of raised intracranial pressure may not be as such easier because whatever we say with the Cushing uh, reflex, like uh, incrementing blood pressure, drop in hair rate, and affections in respiratory pattern are somehow late findings. So even before those findings uh, come into uh, effect, our ultrasound can detect raising intracranial pressure, uh, I, I mean, at earlier uh, point in time. So it's utilization in emergency for uh, such kinds of ocular emergencies is quite becoming a common tool, both in terms of resuscitative aspect as well as guiding uh, our uh, diagnosis uh, aspect. The other interesting thing is in certain centers, even in our center in uh, the Columbus Hospital, we can say that we can't get the ophthalmology consultation access on emergency basis. So on such scenarios, patients can be quite critical enough to refer to an ophthalmology, ophthalmology center and so on. So for those uh, cases, to decide for any ocular injuries like globe rupture, or any retinal detachment or any vitreous hemorrhage and so on, ultrasound is becoming quite an important uh, tool. But here, what I am just trying to touch is on the possibility of utilization of our ultrasound on detecting raising intracranial pressure, uh, meaning the papilledema 
bilateral in most of the uh, scenarios. Here we see a picture of uh, our ocular ultrasound when we place a linear probe uh, ultrasound on the uh, closed eye. If the patient is cooperative enough, we can ask the patient to close uh, his or her eye. And then we can place the probe transversely uh, with gentle pressure. And subsequently, we can get such kind of picture. So this is entirely the glow. So what we can do is we go to the posterior wall of the uh, picture, the orbit. And then from that posterior wall, we go some three millimeters posterior and we look for any dilatation of the optic uh, nerve sheets. Here you see, this is the optic uh, nerve in the picture. And let me show you the video form. As you see, this the honey moon pattern is what we call the, the honey comb appearance is the uh, optic nerve with its sheath surrounding the uh, nerve. And when the pressure increment occurs with intracranial pressure rays and so on, what exactly occurs is the optic nerve will be pushed and there will be swelling here. So that is what we can uh, pick from our ultrasound. If the measurement, some three millimeters from the posterior wall of the uh, globe, if it's more than five millimeters, there are cutoffs on the next slide, it actually suggests raising intracranial pressure. If it's bilateral, on the background of uh, acute trauma with traumatic brain injury, we can say this patient is having uh, raising intracranial pressure and we will adjust our management accordingly. So there are measurements which sorry, are standard. Uh, we're running low in time, so let's uh, uh, finalize. Uh, so we can have a few minutes for question and answer. Okay, I do have some two minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, sure. Thank you, thank you. So there are cutoffs for this measurement. If this measurement just that three millimeter posterior to the uh, uh, posterior wall of the orbit is more than five millimeter in adults that can literally represent elevation of intracranial pressure rays beyond 20 millimeter of mercury. So on the background of acute trauma, with, and with this finding, with lower GCS, we can rightly say there is raise in intracranial uh, pressure. So in summary, point of care ultrasound utilization in uh, emergency is quite fast. And from that, its uh, usage in trauma is quite uh, common and the most important aspect. And again, the most important objective in using ultrasound in blunt abdominal trauma is to ascertain the hemodynamic stability of the patient. If with positive peritoneal collection and unstable vital sign, as we have rightly said, laparotomy is needed. If patient's vital signs are stable, despite the collections in the abdomen, it gives us time to go with the diagnostic workups. So we have to scan just by avoiding those pitfalls which were mentioned for uh, every side of the scan. And in ocular trauma, the optic nerve sheath diameter measurement helps us in eliciting any possibility of raising intracranial uh, pressure. These are some of the selected uh, references. Uh, thank you, it's a long uh, lecture. Uh, and wow. thank you for the participation uh, with the chat box and so on. The floor is open for so there is this uh, first question, patient at ER after sustaining blood abdominal trauma with uh, stable vital sign, but uh, fast shows massive collection of right upper quadrant. How do we proceed? So this is an important uh, question. So as far as the collection is quite massive enough, there is possibility for deterioration in terms of vital sign at any time. So keeping an eye is an important thing for this case. Otherwise, this is uh, something where we decide as a team with the surgical team, as well as the multidisciplinary trauma team to proceed further uh, about the exact cause of that massive bleeding. Is it from the solid organ injury? If that's the case, to grade the injury is one thing. That is how to proceed as far as the vital signs are stable. But if there is any deterioration, obviously, this patient uh, requires uh, laparotomy. So there is the next question, which view is best for pericardiosynthesis and thoracic uh, tap? So 
Pericardiosynthesis, it depends on the uh, cause and on the duration of the buildup of blood on the uh, pericardial space. If it's from acute trauma and we are dealing with findings which are more, I mean, uh, visible, entirely surrounding the uh, pericardium, I mean, uh, entirely surrounding the hairs on the pericardial space with a large size, we can proceed with the subcostal view state because that is the best site which uh, will minimize the interruptions for other resuscitations and so on. Otherwise, we can even do the pericardiosynthesis from uh, apical side. The two are most commonly used, the apical uh, four chamber view and also the subcostal view. But uh, as to my experience, uh, we did quite a lot of pericardiosynthesis from subcostal as well as the apical. So it depends on patient condition as well as the acuity of the buildup of the fluid. So there is another uh, question, best time to do first pass to detect fluid. So there is the most uh, important thing from literature so far, there is no uh, such a defined time for uh, positive fast collection as far as duration of trauma is concerned. Rather, the best advice is to proceed with serial scan. As far as the ultrasound tool is quite portable enough, we will proceed with serial exams and scanning too early and deciding just with that single scan is always misleading. That is the take-home message. And the other is, uh, the other question is how to measure peritoneal fluid collection. Uh, as far as emergency ultrasound utilization is concerned, we try to estimate based on the pocket outpouchings. If there is one pocket outpouching that can estimate, as I said, half a liter of fluid and counting those all pockets may be somehow time consuming. Rather than that, our uh, base should be always the vital sign of the patient. Even with one outpouching or one pocket, patients can have unstable vital sign. In that case, we are more interested in resuscitating that uh, scenario rather than estimating the right amount of the blood. Otherwise, we can use our clinical tools for estimating uh, possible amount of blood loss from the clinical presentation of the patient. The other question is, is it possible to use carotid probe for ocular ultrasound? The answer is a simple yes, but we have to adjust the depths uh, because when we say ocular uh, ultrasound, what we are scanning is more of a superficial uh, structure. So in that sense, if we are in a position not to get the linear or the phased array patterns of probes, what we can do is adjusting the depths, uh, I mean, minimizing the depths of the ultrasound, and we can proceed with the uh, curvilinear one as well. Uh, there is another question, how much is the minimum amount of fluid that is detected by fast? So this is an important question. Experiential people can pick as low as 50 to 100 cc of fluid. And a novice uh, person who is just starting to do such a scan pump can pick 200 to 250 cc of fluid, but we tend to say 50 to 100 is the minimum in experience hands. But also the site matters. Let us say if it's a pericardium, uh, waiting up to 100 cc of fluid to accumulate in the pericardium may be a kind of uh, very bad thing because patients can deteriorate even with that minimal amount of fluid as far as it's an acute trauma. And the other question is, how safe and effective is doing emergency pericardial synthesis in traumatic tamponade in our setup where no emergency for a usually. Of course, the challenge is there, but the issue here is we are getting an obstructive shock patient with confirmed pericardial tamponade from pericardial uh, fluid. In that scenario, our aim is always to salvage the patient, to act or to intervene on that life-treating scenario. So we will proceed with the uh, pericardial synthesis. Uh, despite the risks, we try to uh, monitor the patient with the cardiac monitors to look for any uh, puncture of the heart and so on. Uh, but as the question also mentioned, uh, and its practicality and the things, if it's quite significant uh, bleeding, which actually requires uh, transfusion of uh, lots of blood products in the form like massive transfusion or so, it may be quite difficult. So that's why a multidisciplinary approach is always important. What we can do 
from our emergency pericardiosynthesis is to relieve that obstructive shock state, which is actually affecting perfusion of the patient. So the rest we will proceed with the team. And there is a possibility even to uh, take the patient right away to the operating theater if there is, uh, as far as the difficulty is there for the emergency for a photo. The other question is if the patient has a diffuse subcutaneous emphysema obscuring even to uh, get a liver, how can we do fast? In that scenario, it's quite difficult. There are no any uh, other techniques if the air is quite significant enough to obscure our findings. Not only the air, the body habitus of the patient is also an important. We try to go more lateral if it's possible. And if even that's not possible, as far as the patient is unstable, with possibility of bleeding, which is quite common in trauma, as far as the shock state is concerned, the common causes are usually hemorrhage. We tend to say repeatedly that. So we uh, proceed with our resuscitation aspect. The other question is, how can ultrasound help to know when there is uh, occult uh, pneumothorax? So this is only when we are lucky enough to establish the absence of lung slide. Other than that, to establish all the other findings, like barcode sign or lung point, it's quite time-taking. And if it's an emergency scenario where the patient reads, I mean, needs urgent resuscitation, it may be difficult. But if the patient's vital signs are okay, and if the pneumothorax is evolving, as far as it's occult, uh, it gives us time. When it evolves, by then we can pick. But the issue comes if we are also planning to intubate this same patient. So intubating someone and putting on positive pressure ventilation and to the extent of even bugging with our bug valve mask on the background of occult pneumothoraxes can cause the possibility to convert it to tension pneumothorax. By then, we have to act uh, at the earliest uh, with needle insertion at the second intercostal space, as we always say, and uh, prepare for definitive vestibular insertion. If it's a bilateral subcutaneous emphysema or such scenarios, it's even uh, mandatory to do bilateral vestibular insertion. The other is how can we grade renal injury and respective management? With ultrasound, we can do this. The renal injury aspect, if the patient's vital signs are stable, and if we have detected fluid collection in the peritoneum, the next step to grade renal injury is to get CT scan. That is going to be a gold standard. And subsequently, you can proceed with But the issue is, if the patient is unstable, and at the same time we are suspecting renal injury, uh, what comes first is to go with our resuscitation and to think about the laparotomy. It may even end up being an intra-op uh, finding to go with the uh, anything you can say about how long will it take to change hypoechoic presentation to hyperechoic appearance on well, ultrasound? It depends from patient to patient. So, for example, if a patient is on the background of taking the anticoagulants, as we have mentioned for our case, it may take uh, time. So there is no as such a right uh, time frame to find that. What about fast on perforating stomach from trauma? Uh, this is again. Of course, FAST nowadays, I mean, incorporates almost everything. If we can get a multiple air pattern there with the distorted anatomy, it can give us a telltale sign. Otherwise, uh, from the FAST scan sites, from the four sites, there is no such typical finding for rupture of the stone. Uh, the IBC measurement, this is also somehow a technical thing. Uh, I would be happy if we can and meet in person and we do this in practical demonstrations for some of the uh, questions I know with only a lecture and a brief video or picture it may not be uh, as much easy to go with the details. Uh, there is one question how we can detect pneumothorax from abdominal ultrasound since air goes up to the depth of the chest. So what we are doing for the pneumothorax detection is not the abdominal ultrasound. Even the probe itself is different. So for detecting pneumothorax it is a linear probe and the scanning is on the chest. And for picking blood in the abdomen, what we are using is a carbolinear probe and our focus is in the abdomen. I think this uh, clarifies the question. So the other is, uh, can we rule out ICP with ocular ultrasound? It may be difficult, especially if it's just a buildup of the uh, raised intracranial pressure, but at least it can give us a clue for the earlier findings because the other signs are usually 
late comers. So there is this interesting study which came out just two years back. Uh, whatever is important to detect raising intracranial pressure is rather than the imaging modalities, it's our clinical suspicion. So with that, uh, we can focus with the clinical uh, finding for the patients based on the GCS, based on the mechanism, and based on our CT findings, how tight is the brain, and so on. So uh, we may go with our clinical suspicion rather than the ultrasound. So for the pediatrics, this is the last question. Among pediatrics patients, is there a technical difference while performing fast? Yes, even the anatomical structures themselves differ, but the utilization of ultrasound, uh, even though it has some technical difficulties, it's algorithmic, uh, algorithm-based approach and the intervention is more or less similar uh, as far as the vital sign of patients are there. Thank you. Okay, thank you uh, for inviting me for this important uh, cause and also for the interactive participation from uh, my colleagues. And uh, I promise one thing, if anyone is around us uh, who can, I mean, work with the practical aspects when we do the scans on real patient scenarios and so on, uh, as a follow-up from this lecture, I'm okay with that, with my colleagues and uh, with my uh, team, with my specialty trainees as well. So we are open for that. And uh, this is one sort of advocacy for good cause because utilizing ultrasound in trauma minimizes time it requires to operate on someone with a deranged vital signs and so on. So because of uh, that aspect, it will help us in uh, bringing this important issue and also disseminating this uh, important uh, aspect. So thank you very much. Oh, 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 oh,